thanks, Brandon, for the delightful uh, introductory talk. Um, my name is Elsa Cook. I'm a graduate student here in Charlottesville in the Department of Chemistry um, at the University of Virginia. And today I want to talk to you about some work that we've been doing to measure the UV photo destruction of um, astrochemical ices of interstellar importance. Uh, this work is being done in collaboration with Karen Oberg and Edith Fayol um, at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And I'd also like to thank uh, John Yates, whose laboratory this work is being conducted in, um, as well as Eric Herbs, Rob Garrett, and Matthew Reich. So I just wanted to begin by um, talking a little bit about how we tend to think about UV radiation in life. Um, so most of you will be more familiar with the left-hand side of this plot, so how we think about UV radiation on Earth. Um, and we tend to think of it as a destructive uh, mechanism. So for example, in skin damage, so sunburn and sun tans, um, as well as DNA damage on the cellular level. Uh, we also use uh, UV radiation on Earth as a sanitizer, so for example, in food storage. Um, but we also know that on Earth, UV radiation can be essential to life forming. Um, so for example, in vitamin D production, which is important in calcium metabolism, as well as uh, producing our own ozone layer by the photo destruction of oxygen. Um, in interstellar space, we tend to think of UV radiation as a heat or energy source, which can drive reactions that wouldn't occur at such low temperatures. Uh, UV radiation is able to dissolve molecules, as well as destroying molecules and ions and creating reactive fragments that can then combine and form more complex species. Uh, so these icy dust grains play a key role in producing the complex organic molecules that we observe in interstellar regions. Um, so with infrared telescopes, we can see the uh, spectral bands of several condensed phase molecules. And I'm showing some of them here on the right, um, where the areas roughly correspond to, the, to their relative abundance in the ices. So we have water, which is the most abundant ice species, followed by CO2 and CO. And then we have less abundant species like uh, methanol, ammonia, and methane. And these ices can be processed uh, not only by thermal heating, but also by UV photons, as well as other energetic particles like electrons, cosmic rays, and ions. Um, and this ice processing can result in reactive fragments that can then recombine and form potentially prebiotic organic molecules. So to understand the importance of these processes, we really need uh, accurate laboratory measurements of their cross-sections. Go back. Okay, so what do I mean when I'm talking about a cross-section? Um, so I just talked to you a little bit about how I refer to these cross-sections um, in this talk. So for example, um, when we're talking about UV photo dissociation, we have some molecule that has a rate of being destroyed, which is D molecule by DT. Um, and this is equal to the photon flux. And this is a number of photons per some area per time. Uh, and the concentration of the molecule in the ice. And then we have this sigma value, which is essentially a probability that the photon will be absorbed and then destroy the ice molecule. I mean, these probability factors are especially important because once we've measured them in the lab, we can then use them with the UV uh, flux in interstellar space to calculate some rate coefficient k, which can then be input into astrochemical models. Um, so how do we go about creating the UV field in the laboratory? Well, the UV field in interstellar space really depends on uh, the physical properties of the environment. So near stars, uh, the UV radiation tends to be dominated by black body emission. But when we go deep into dense cloud cores or on the disk surfaces, you can see we have this really strong emission at Lyman Alpha, which comes from the recombination of uh, hydrogen with cosmic rays. So in the laboratory, uh, there's several different ways that we can create this radiation. Um, so people have used uh, discharge lamps, lasers, and synchrotrons. Uh, in our laboratory, we're using a hydrogen discharge lamp. It's shown in this image here. Um, and this is a spectra that shows the emission from our hydrogen lamp. So it's 10% hydrogen diluted in argon. And you can see it also has this really strong emission at 121 nanometers. Uh, so this brings me to our current work, where we're measuring the photo destruction of a range of astrochemically relevant ice species. Um, there have been, ooh, go back. Um, there have been several studies of the photo destruction of interstellar ices, um, but most of them don't report a UV cross-section. 
Two main studies have been conducted which do report the cross-section. However, their ices were really thick, so only the, about the top 10% of the ice um, was able to absorb the photons. Uh, a study of ices in the optically thin regime hasn't been previously attempted, and while some case studies do exist, um, there's no systematic study that measures the ice photo destruction for optically thin ices. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the ices that are shown in red. So the CO2, methanol, water, and ammonia ices. And we will study their photo destruction in optically thin ices. Um, we'll also measure not only the pure ices, but also their photo destruction in astrophysically relevant uh, matrices like water and CO, and also in inert noble gas matrices just to understand the physics a little bit better. Uh, and we also measure the cross-sections at a range of different temperatures, which can tell us more about the chemistry. Okay, so I just want to tell you a little bit about the experimental setup that we're using. So we use a vacuum chamber, so as Brandon was saying, um, in interstellar space, the pressures are much lower, so we need to pump away all the air. So we use a vacuum chamber, uh, it's coupled to an infrared spectrometer, which me measures the condensed phase of the ice. Um, the ices are deposited from the gas phase at the back of the chamber from um, using a gas phase doser. And then we have our photon source, which is, as I said before, a hydrogen discharge lamp. It's flowed with a hydrogen argon mixture and then excited by a radio frequency coil. And then beneath the cell we have a mass spectrometer, which is able to monitor the gas phase. Um, so if I just cut away the walls of the chamber, you can get a clearer image of the irradiation configuration. Um, so the ice is condensed here on a potassium bromide disc that's pressed into a tungsten grid, and this is cooled by a closed cycle helium cryostat. Um, the ice is uh, suspended at 45 degrees to both the infrared beam and our uh, UV photon source. Um, so I just want to introduce a couple of the preliminary results from our experiments. So the first ice species that we've studied is CO2 ice. So CO2 ices have only one major channel at 121 nanometers, and that's the formation of uh, carbon monoxide and oxygen atoms. And in the gas phase, this proceeds with uh, efficiency that's near unity. However, in ices, the uh, CO can recombine with oxygen atoms to reform the CO2 molecules. Um, but this does have some barrier, so we will need some excess energy if we want that process to happen. Uh, the oxygen atoms can also combine with CO2 to form this carbon trioxide species, or also with other oxygen atoms to form O2 or ozone. Um, so this, these spectra show uh, the radiation of CO2 over time. So the scale bar is just a measure of the time of the irradiation. You can see the loss of this stretching mode of CO2 over time, and you can see the CO and the carbon trioxide are growing in during the experiment. Um, so in order to extract the cross-section from these measurements, we fit a first-order decay to the data. Um, so this has the form dCO2 by dt, um, is the concentration of the CO2 times some rate coefficient j. Um, the integrated rate expression is an exponential, so we plot the logarithm of the loss of the CO2 over time, and then the slope is that rate coefficient j. And then from j, we can extract our cross-section using the known laboratory photon flux. Uh, so here are some initial results for the CO2 ices. Um, you can see we've ran these experiments at 25, 40, and 55 Kelvin for CO2, as shown in the black circles. And you can see that the CO2 photodissociation cross-section doesn't really change over temperature. Um, the photodissociation cross-section is low compared to the gas phase, so only around one CO2 per seven photons is destroyed, whereas it's near unity in the gas phase. We also add CO to the ice, and the cross-section is essentially the same. Um, compared to adding a water, a water ice matrix, where we can see the cross-section is decreased. Um, this is probably because uh, the water ice, when it's photodissociated, forms these hydroxyl radicals, which can react with the photoproduced CO and reform the CO2. We also looked at methanol ices, so as Brandon kind of mentioned, methanol is really important to us because for us it's a complex molecule, I and mean, it can be a precursor to potentially prebiotic molecules like glycoaldehyde. Um, so these spectra show the loss of the methanol band over time, and you can see some of the photoproducts that are growing in. So we have CO2 and CO, um, formaldehyde, and also methane. 
Um, and there are some other smaller signatures of more complex species as well. Uh, so here are the results of the measurements of the cross-sections for methanol. Um, so in contrary to CO2, you can see that the cross-section does increase with temperature. Actually, it's almost exponential. Um, and there are a couple of explanations for why this might happen. So as we increase the temperature, the photofragments in the methanol ice can diffuse away from each other more easily. So we'll have less recombinations to reform the methanol. Um, the photofragments also, as temperature is increased, can uh, dissolve more easily. So we also would have less reformation of methanol. Um, we can see again that the cross-section is low compared to the gas phase. So only about 1 in 25 photons uh, result in a net dissociation of methanol at 25 Kelvin. And this increases to about 1 in 7 at 100 Kelvin. And we can also see, uh, in contrary to CO2, adding a water ice matrix doesn't really change the cross-section, indicating that the photofragment diffusion in the water ice matrix isn't really changed by having a, uh, a water ice. Um, so some of these results can be explained in part by the cage effect in ices. So we saw that the gas phase cross-section tend tended to be much higher than the solid phase cross-section. Um, and this is because the ice matrix, so these red ice species, um, hinders the diffusion of the photofragments, so then we just get more recombination events. As we increase the temperature, the photofragment uh, diffusion becomes more easy, um, and then we will see that the cross-section would increase with temperature, and we see this result for our methanol ices. Um, so the next steps in our survey are to continue these measurements for other ices of interstellar importance. So we've made just a couple of preliminary measurements for water and ammonia ices. Um, so ammonia at around 70 Kelvin and water at 120 Kelvin. And you can see actually the cross sections are very low even compared to our CO2 and methanol ices. And um, this is probably because the recombination it, um, happens really fast in the water ice or ammonia matrix because it's most likely due to hydrogen recombination. Um, so just in summary, so we're conducting this survey of photodestruction cross-sections for optically thin ices of interstellar importance. Um, the photodissociation rates will help us provide some information about the chemistry occurring in the ices and the radical recombination rates. Um, the temperature dependencies and relative rates can, um, in part, be explained by the cage effect. And um, these quantitative measurements will be especially important uh, for understanding ice chemistry that could potentially form prebiotic molecules in interstellar space. Questions? Uh, just, uh, I didn't get the part that you had to excite your sample with radio frequency before doing. Uh, uh, so it's not the sample. The radio frequency is just to provide the radiation source. So we need some, um, we're just providing a hydrogen discharge lamp to create the UV radiation. The radio frequency source isn't involved in the sample, the ice sample. OK. Yeah. So it has been shown in prebiotic chemistry uh, studies on early Earth that uh, hydrogen cyanide has a potential clue uh, sure. role uh, in combination with UV light. Uh -huh. So I was wondering if first you have done some ex uh, studies on hydrogen cyanide, and then if you have done some studies on combination of molecules. So if you can detect something different when you mix kind, different kind of molecules. Sure. So we haven't done hydrogen cyanide. It's a possibility. Um, it's very dangerous. So we tend to stick with the more dangerous species last if we can. Um, but people have studied the photodissociation of hydrogen cyanide as well. And um, we haven't done it yet. And as for the ice mixtures, this is also something we'd like to do, but we start with the simplest ice first and then work our way up to the more complicated species just so we can really understand what's happening in the ice. Anybody else? So this is really cool. I was curious, you mentioned that you have CO plus O recombination, mm -hmm. and from a photochemical perspective, that's often treated as being spin forbidden. So yeah, do so you think there's any intermediate steps, or do you have any right. impurities that right. sort of drive that 
Dallas's? I would say that we don't know that we have CO plus O recombination. It's just a possibility. And um, the reason why I just showed it is because uh, we may have some excited CO and oxygen atoms that this process could occur. So when we irradiate the ice, some of them will stay in an excited state, maybe allowing some spin ridden process to happen. But there's no way that we can possibly tell that that's happening. And actually, I would think it's not happening because we don't have a temperature dependence with our CO2 irradiation. Um, so it's, yeah, it's something we can't really distinguish, but is definitely forbidden. And I think the barrier is pretty high. It's maybe like a thousand Kelvin or something. So maybe it doesn't happen. But yeah. Hi, that was, I enjoyed your talk. Quick question. Uh, I understand that the more complex organic molecules don't show up in the actual uh, samples. What I'm wondering is, has there been any work in terms of modeling them numerically that would show necessarily if the, <laughs> guess that's a no. It's not, I guess not. So, <laughs> the gong. The, uh, I was wondering if the, if the molecules, more complex molecules, have been modeled to show what the rate of dissociation or probability of more complex yeah. molecules would be. Um, I don't, as far as I know, I don't think that there are any cross-section measurements for really complex ice species. Um, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. But the modeling, well, you're going to hear about some modeling in the next talk. <laughs> um, but I, I think modeling for complex ices gets really complicated really fast. So Chris will talk about the most simplest ice system. But even getting to water or just uh, methanol ice, it gets so complicated. So I think it's something that uh, the field should do, but it's going to take a lot of time. Um, but as for the experiments, which is what I know a little bit more about, um, there are experiments where people do see complex molecules and ices. If you want to look at really complicated species, you need to do something like GCMS. So you would collect the ice sample and then look in the mass spectrometer and figure out what's in there. And people have seen things like amino acids and other things. Well, they say they have. <laughs> yeah, so, sure. Anybody else? All right, let's thank the speaker again. Thank <laughs> you.